Uh, thank you so much, Pat, for that introduction. Um, as Pat says, we have a book just out just now um, called The King in the North, The Pictish Realms of Fortrue and Kay, available in all good bookstores. Um, that's my talk over for the evening. Thank you very much. Uh, very reasonable price, $14.99 or less. Um, so th um, thanks for uh, that introduction, Pat. And uh, yes, the pics are still relatively um, mysterious uh, elements of Scotland's early history, um, but one that's increasingly illuminated by archaeological and uh, new historical work uh, as well, which has uh, really came to the fore in the last uh, two decades, I would say, in particular, and particularly the last 10 years, really, with lots more archaeological um, projects and understanding of the pics beginning to emerge uh, through renewed focus on, on the pics and their archaeology. Um, so for those of you who don't know much about the pics, well, the pics are essentially the equivalent of the Anglo-Saxons, uh, contemporaries with Anglo-Saxons in um, southern Britain. Um, and the pics are first mentioned in late Roman sources as these troublesome groups who live north of the Roman frontier um, in AD 297. Uh, and they go on to cause all sorts of havoc in uh, the Roman Empire, involved in the Barbarian Conspiracy, for example, in AD 367, um, when they get together with the, the Franks and the, the Scots and other groups and, and raid areas uh, south of um, Hadrian's Wall. <clears throat> um, but it's really in the post-Roman period that the Picts particularly come to the fore in terms of becoming uh, one of, if not the most powerful series of kingdoms and uh, overkingship of northeast Scotland and ruling over an area that uh, stretched from modern day Fife up to the Northern Isles, as far as we know, uh, and probably across to, to the Western Isles. Uh, and really ruling until the 10th century, when there seems to be some sort of merging of the Picts and the Scots to create uh, the Kingdom of Alba, which is essentially the, the forerunner of the medieval Kingdom of Scotland. <clears throat> um, and this is uh, a period, particularly in the, in the post-Roman period, where we begin to see um, a whole series of different developments in society. Uh, and in archaeological record, we can see that there's developing hierarchies. The first mention of kings, for example, um, occurs in the post-Roman period in, in Northern Britain. Um, and we see the emergence of things like uh, uh, cemeteries, major cemeteries for powerful families and lineages. Uh, we see warfare coming to the fore in terms of how kings um, gain new territory and retain followers. Um, and we also see the emergence of things like uh, the written, written word and also developments in, in religion with the uh, adoption of Christianity, for example, from the um, sixth and definitely the seventh century uh, AD uh, onwards. <clears throat> so as I say, the Picts are first mentioned in this, in this late Roman context in AD 297. Um, and as far as we can see, that seems to represent some sort of uh, amalgamation of different uh, tribal groups under um, a larger um, political and social um, grouping uh, known, as, known as the Picts, which essentially is, is a Roman nickname, it means the, the painted people. So it's uh, another word for barbarians, essentially. But that's a name that seems to be adopted by the neighbors of the Picts and presumably by the Picts themselves, although we know very little of that because we have very few historical records from the Picts themselves, apart from a series of, of king lists. <clears throat> um, and we can see that the Picts were major enemies of Rome. They're um, repeat, repeatedly referred to in terms of uh, conflict um, north of and um, around the Roman frontier. Um, and there's this fantastic dice tower from um, the uh, imperial frontier in, in Germany uh, that has this um, um, uh, statement on, on, on here in Latin, 
the picks are defeated, the enemy is destroyed, playing safety. So we can see the picks were playing on the Roman mentality as being, you know, um, major enemies and the epitome of, of the enemies of, of Rome. <clears throat> Um, as I say, there's very few historical records for the Picts themselves, and that really um, is simply a list of kings, which in one version has uh, this origin myth, which talks about uh, Cruthni, the father of the Picts, and he has seven sons, and those sons are essentially a claim to, to territory, for they have geographically focused names, for example, Fief for Fife, um, Kate for Caithness. So it's really telling us um, where the Picts ruled or saw themselves as ruling. Um, and it's one of the uh, information sources we used to reconstruct maps like this with the territories of the Picts and other um, ethnic and social groups within early um, Scotland or what came to be Scotland. <clears throat> um, the most powerful group of the Picts seems to be in the group known as Fortru. Um, and uh, the kings of Fortru become the overkings of the whole of Pickland from, from the seventh century after a major battle called the Battle of Nectansmere, in which uh, King Brathay uh, defeats uh, King Egfrith of, of Northumbria uh, and essentially wrestles back control of major parts of Pickland that had been um, uh, controlled by uh, the um, Northumbrians for a number of decades. Um, and this territory of Fortu was always thought to be located down in, in central Scotland, in where we traditionally see the, the, the kind of cradle of the Scottish kingdom um, in uh, central Scotland. But uh, more recently, it's been, been thought that this, this kingdom, Fortu, actually occupied an area much further north, around about the Murray Firth region. Um, due to a whole range of place name and historical uh, evidence. Um, so that gave new lights or new focus on the northern picks, the northern territories beyond the Manx, around about uh, Stonehaven and Aberdeenshire. Um, new uh, vigour and uh, recognition that the northern parts of Pickland were clearly uh, important. Um, and that's really where our project at the University of Aberdeen really kicked off in terms of beginning to uh, look from an archaeological perspective at northern Pickland. You know, if this was such an important region, can we identify any of the major social and political centres? And can we track the, the development of this uh, polity and uh, these power groups uh, through time? And there were already things in the archaeological record that actually suggested the importance of the north. So... One of the iconic monuments of the Picts are these symbol stones, and these are um, focused very much in northern Pictland territories, uh, particularly Aberdeenshire, uh, the Murray Firth, and stretching further, further north. Um, but how do you identify the, the centres uh, of power in this time period? Um, well, the few references that we do have tend to refer to fortified sites, um, forts, Promontory forts, hill forts, as being centres of, of power, as centres of settlement and centres of um, uh, kings and, and the rulership. Um, but these were fairly poorly, poorly documented for the time period. Um, and the other major monument that is of interest, I think, uh, to a whole range of disciplines, uh, art historians, archaeologists, um, etc., are these, these symbol stone monuments, which are still a fascinating element of the Picts. And they tend to have these paired symbols on the early monuments. Um, and the best guess of them is that there's some sort of uh, identity marker telling you something about the name or the rank or the identity of probably elites within society. Um, and these are also found on Christian monuments from the seventh century uh, onwards. Um, marking people in this case here. So you can see it's definitely something about the identity uh, of individuals, um, judging by this kind of iconography. So what I want to do tonight is really just take you on a quick tour of um, three different uh, landscapes within Pickland to highlight some of the work that we've been doing and how this feeds into um, our growing picture of how these picture societies are developing through time. 
Um, and I want to start with this site at uh, Dunnacare, which is uh, just south of Aberdeen and uh, near uh, Stonehaven, near Dunotter Castle, for any of you who've been there. Um, and this was a site that was known since the 19th century um, to uh, as being the fine spot of a number of carved stone monuments. And these were quite rough and ready symbol stones compared to what you'll see um, in some of the other sites, uh, uh, later sites. Uh, so they're always thought to be um, perhaps early examples of the Pictish symbol tradition. So you can see things like double discs here, crescents, uh, and a fish here. Um, and these came from this site, this tiny, uh, what is today a tiny sea stack, um, just to the north of Denotter Castle. Um, it doesn't look like much today, and it was uh, quite a, a difficult place to excavate and, and get to. Um, we had to hire a professional climber to get us on top of this uh, sea stack. Um, and what did we find? Well, we actually found that this site would have been much more impressive in the past. It's a highly eroded promontory, we think. So it would have been a, a promontory fort with houses and buildings uh, on top of this um, promontory. Uh, and essentially an early version of what becomes um, these key power centers, you know, a fortified settlement. Um, and the way we could tell this was uh, through um, uh, excavation uh, around about the edge of the sea stack, for example, we found traces of um, uh, a wall. These are the beam slots, uh, timber slots here, and the stone facing for a timber lace rampart. So this is a classic way of defending um, uh, uh, Roman Iron Age and early medieval um, high status promontory forts uh, through a timber framework and stone, stone facing to that. And then we found uh, buildings inside. Um, so here um, you can see, for example, the stone curbs, fireplaces here, and some of these dirty brown layers round about being partly excavated here were the floor layers um, of dwellings within, within the fort. And we found evidence for their daily lives, things like spindle whorls for spinning yarn, um, grinding stones for grinding grain, um, but also markers of higher status contacts and, and activities. So we had burnishing stones for um, high status metalworking uh, and very rare Roman finds. So, you know, by the time this site was in operation in the third, fourth centuries, um, it was, you know, far north of the Roman frontier of Hadrian's Wall. Um, but yet they were receiving Roman goods, including really rare types of Roman glass. Uh, and shards of semen, which don't look like much today. Um, this is essentially the rubbish, rubbish that people have thrown out. Um, but we've we got to imagine, you know, the whole vessels, which would have been very rare and precious objects. So these people were connected. They were um, elites within society. Uh, and the really fascinating thing about Dunakir was that the um, forts of this time period are actually really, really unusual. So radiocarbon dates showed that the site was constructed probably in the second century AD uh, and went through to the fourth century AD. So with its height really in the third, fourth centuries. Um, and really this is an ideal location for launching raids on the empire, the seaborne raids that uh, the late Roman sources talk about in terms of things like the barbarian conspiracy and Gildas talks about in the fifth century about the Picts being seaborne raiders. And so it looks like in this late Roman Iron Age, they are beginning to construct sites like this, clearly with a view to expanding territory and influence and uh, networks of contact in, in this time period. So it's really a, a glimpse into the, to the origins of the Picts and that bigger polity that seems to emerge in the face of empire in that late Roman uh, context. Right, so um, our second site for tonight is uh, uh, further inland um, at uh, Rhiney, and this is about 40 minutes drive west of Aberdeen, um, in, uh, just south of uh, Huntley. Uh, and this is just a small village today, but clearly it was you know, a real hotspot of activity and a real influential landscape in uh, the Pictish uh, period. Um, and the reason we were interested in, in landscape at Rhiney was a number of things, a number of hill forts here, including Tappanoth in the background, 
uh, but primarily for the, the number of carved stones that came from uh, uh, the vicinity of the modern village of Rainy, um, which includes the cross day number one there, which still stands in situ to the south of the village today. Um, carving a warrior, he's quite worn there, but you can maybe just see his uh, shield and he's carrying a spear. Um, and uh, probably the most impressive monument, the Rainy Man, this uh, fearsome looking figure carrying an axe over his shoulder. And a number of the more conventional symbol stones with these paired symbols, abstract and animal based symbols. Um, and there's the Rainy Man in close up with his fearsome teeth. Um, and as I say, the cross stain here the, with the salmon and the Pictish beast, as it's known, still stands in the field today. And that's quite unusual for these to still to be standing in situ. Um, and aerial photography in the late 1970s, when the uh, Rainy Man was discovered just down slope from that stone, uh, revealed a whole series of enclosures buried underneath the ground. So there's some sort of settlement here. Um, and then the the final reason we were interested in this landscape was because it's a really interesting place name. Because we have so few historical sources, um, things like place names are incredibly useful um, in terms of uh, hinting at the significance of past places. So rhino has got this unusual place name element, re for king, uh, and seems to mean a place associated with a great or a sacred king. Um, so this was all the ammunition we needed to go and have a look at the site um, where the cross stain stands and excavations from 2012 to 2017 revealed um, a, a very high status elite settlement and uh, enclosure complex. And what you see here is the dark bands are actually ditches for another um, fortified enclosed settlement with buildings inside represented by these postals and the like. And here's a drone shot of our excavations. It's hard to see, but this is quite a prominent knoll today. Um, and it's this knoll that's been enclosed by ditches and then laterally by a huge palisade, a big wooden wall, um, which would have been uh, created this really impressive enclosure uh, with buildings inside. So here in the Blue Peter moment is one we made earlier, showing what, you know, how it might have looked like with a big wooden wall in its latter stages and the buildings uh, inside. Um, and nearby, uh, we discovered a, a cemetery um, of square barrows, and the warrior figure clearly came from this cemetery uh, um, down by the modern day village. So a cemetery contemporary with, with the settlement. Uh, and the reason we could tell that this was a very high state settlement was because of the, again, the kind of bits and pieces that have been left behind by people living at the site. So again, these are just little fragments, um, but they're really significant fragments in terms of these are um, shards of uh, late Roman amphora, which actually come from the Eastern Mediterranean um, in the sixth century, which is very unusual, uh, long distance contacts in this time period. And this material turns up to places like Tintagel um, and uh, documented royal sites in Ireland. Uh, and there's only two other fine spots in Scotland. Uh, one is Whithorn, the famous ecclesiastical and probably major power centre. Uh, another is um, uh, Dumbarton Rock, which was the later seat of the uh, Strathclyde uh, uh, kings. So in um, uh, elite company here. Um, and we can see that perhaps the part of the reason for the wealth of this landscape and settlement was that it was a major center of production. So again, we are finding the things left behind. Um, so we, we, we found lots, hundreds of molds for making high status brooches, uh, hand pins, all the sort of things that elites were wearing in this time period. And also molds for making things like uh, ingots, which are little bars, which people of raw metal I forgot to say about the late Roman amphora is that they were probably for storing wine. Um, so this is uh, what um, the Picts were drinking their wine from uh, in, in this uh, time period. Uh, and also elements of um, the elite culture in terms of dress as well. Um, 
So we, sorry, my internet's a bit unstable, so I just switched my video off. Um, so we also found um, uh, things like dress pins, cloak pins, and parts of, of brooches, uh, and also more unusual uh, metalwork, things like this amazing uh, little iron pin, um, which actually has um, in the shape of, a, of an axe um, and has a serpent biting onto the uh, end of the axe there. Um, and we also found uh, molds uh, for making animal figurines uh, and of the type of animals um, seen on uh, the Pictish uh, stones uh, itself. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Can you all hear me? Okay, uh, my internet seems a bit dodgy. Um, we can hear you, Graham. Okay, that's good. Sorry. Um, yeah, so we found these uh, uh, figurine molds as well. So for making little animals of the type of animals you see carved on the picture stones. Uh, so we're beginning to see elements of material culture that you can actually see in the iconography of, of the picture stones. So really making a link between those iconic monuments and the actual settlements and archaeology we're finding in the ground. Um, and then the dates for the site uh, were uh, really interesting as well. So like Dunacare, it's just starting in, in the kind of Roman Iron Age in the fourth century AD, um, but it goes through to the middle sixth century AD, uh, just right about the time when we begin to get the first historical references to uh, Pictish kings that we can um, uh, 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 identify with other sources. Uh, cross-reference uh, with other sources. Um, and really that was, you know, an incredible um, discovery at Rhiney and a really exciting one, but we didn't really realize at the time that it was really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's in the Rhiney Valley. Uh, so overlooking Rhiney here, so you can see this is a drone shot of Tappan Off, uh, this really impressive uh, hill fort, Scotland's second highest hill fort on the top here. Um, overlooking the village, which you'll see in the background there. Um, and there's two forts at Tappan North. The top one is Iron Age, so much earlier, but 400, 200 BC. But you can just maybe make out this lower wall um, towards the bottom of the picture here, um, which is, um, or was it, well, was always thought to be earlier in date than the Iron Age uh, fort on top. Um, but much to our surprise, that wasn't the case. Um, so we did some early work here doing survey work, particularly using something known as uh, a LIDAR, so laser scanning essentially of the hill. Uh, and this showed up these incredible house platforms here, or what we um, now know as house platforms. Um, so you can see all these little divots almost in the hill um, shown up by uh, this image on the left here. Uh, and it was always, well, it's been recognized since the 19th 70s really there were a number of house platforms here maybe a couple of hundred uh, but this uh, laser scanning and also photogrammetry survey um, showed that there were actually as many as 800 uh, platforms on the hill uh, here at Tappa North so you know what date were these and what um, what uh, what was the character of of this site um, well the rampart the lower rampart is of of Tappa North is really impressive it encloses 17 hectares so it's the second largest uh, hill fort known in, uh, in Scotland. Um, and our excavation showed that it was a big rubble bank with a palisade on top. So another kind of big wooden fence. And this palisade must have um, went for 1.5 kilometers. So you can just imagine the amount of resources, the amount of wood needed to um, enclose this site. So a huge monumental uh, effort. Uh, and then we excavated a number of house platforms um, and showed that some of these had Roman finds on them. So like Dunacare, these people were connected in this Roman period, but also finds suggesting activity going on into the early medieval, the Pictish uh, phases as well. And that was shown or, um, and uh, proved by the radiocarbon dates we got from the site, which go from the, the third 
and 4th centuries AD through to the 6th century. Um, so it really implies that what we've got at Tapanoff is a huge settlement. Um, and so far, all the platforms we dug to date seem to be broadly uh, contemporary. So it looks like, you know, potentially you get a huge settlement here. And you know, only a proportion of those 800 uh, platforms are in use at any one time. You're, you're talking about a population of, of certainly hundreds, if not thousands, almost a, a proto-town. Whether that's a, a seasonal uh, settlement, you know, perhaps people gathering at certain times, times of the year, perhaps in, uh, to give tribute to the, the kings living in the valley below, um, or is it a permanently uh, occupied year-round settlement? And that's, you know, the subject of ongoing research um, at, at Aberdeen. Right, so that's uh, looking at the kind of middle, middle Pictish period when, when the Pictish kings really begin to emerge and begin to uh, establish themselves. Um, the final site that I'm going to look at tonight really tells us more about the the height of the uh, Pictish kingdoms and also the, their, their eventual decline, really. Um, and this I'll, I'll discuss through looking at this, this final site, which is a uh, Berg Head up in uh, the Murray Coast uh, in the Murray Firth area. Um, and this is, this is another promontory fort, like Dunakir, but you can see um, that it's an altogether different scale and different preservation level to what we found at Dunakir. So what you're looking at here is the modern town of Burghead in the background, and then the foreground is the remains of the Pictish fort. So on the left, uh, you can see the ramparts of the lower citadel, the middle ramparts here and uh, seaward defences, uh, or what's left of them, of the upper fort. And you can maybe just see some excavations in the garden here of the Coast Guard Station House, which was our excavations uh, a couple of years back. Um, and this, uh, unfortunately, is a slightly sad tale of, of destruction at Burghead. So in the 19th century, the modern town of Burghead was um, built over uh, around about 50 to 60 percent of the fort was destroyed by the modern town of Burghead. Um, and this is uh, um, James MacDonald in the 1860s talking about that destruction. Um, but uh, the, the ramparts, so the landward ramparts being hurled down the hill, um, thrown back into their ditches, uh, and the upper surface of the fort being desecrated, um, robbed for stone, um, and you know, fantastic kind of throwaway line here about how many coins, battle axes, and spearheads then found were given to any English tourist who came that way. So um, if you're... Uh, uh, in England just now or, or anywhere else around the world or near Burghead, go and have a look in your um, grandparents' uh, attics and see if you can find any of these artifacts from Burghead. Um, so unfortunately, a, a real tale of destruction, but that destruction also led to some quite remarkable discoveries um, at Burghead, uh, which has whetted the appetite for the site for, for centuries. Uh, so Professor Stewart of the University of Aberdeen in 1809 um, describes um, how all around the top of the rock are seen the remains of a rampart, um, talking about uh, the timber and stone element to that, so another kind of timber lace rampart as we tend to uh, identify on sites of this time period, uh, and also talking about the number of carvings from the site, particularly of a bull, he says, very well executed. And indeed, we have six surviving stones with carvings of bulls on them, one in the British Museum, one in, in the National Museum, uh, two on site at Burghead and two in Elgin Museum. And they're, they're quite remarkable stones really, full, full of character. Um, so the one in the British Museum is near the Sutton Hoo ship burial um, and National Museum down in the prehistoric galleries. And, and as many as uh, 30 or more of these stones with, with bulls were found in the 19th century, but the majority of them went uh, into the construction of the modern harbour. So again, a real tale of, of, of loss there, really. But we have these, these ones remaining to give us a hint as to what uh, these carvings looked like and um, the impressive nature of the fort. And there was also lots of uh, other fragments of sculpture found in that 19th century um, destruction and, and later um, excavations as well. 
uh, which include um, Christian cross lamps um, and fragments of uh, box shrines. So these are early Christian monuments of the 8th, 9th century. Uh, and their character and their find spots suggest that there, there was a major church at Burghead actually within the fort. So this um, is talking of, of a very different type of um, power center that were, where um, Christianity is very much embraced by these later Pictish rulers in the 7th, 8th, 9th centuries AD. Um, and we can see the, the power, of, power of, of the church and, uh, and of God is very much uh, uh, seen as part of uh, the rulership of these uh, Pictish uh, elites. Um, so excavations at Barkhead has had a long history, not always glamorous history, um, but James MacDonald in the 1860s did some great work and actually pretty well uh, uh, recorded for the time. Uh, he excavated in the lower citadel uh, and did some wonderful watercolour drawings of the rampart, giving you an idea of the scale of, of these features, showing that uh, they were at least seven to eight metres thick uh, and still survive today to six metres high down the lower citadel. So, huge number of resources, again, going into the construction of these forts. Um, and uh, MacDonald's showing in his watercolours that, again, there was timber lacing, there was a timber framework joining the two wall faces and with a kind of rubble core. And then Hugh Young in the 1890s, <clears throat> um, the grandson of one of the Youngs who uh, built the, the modern town, excavated uh, in the fort, and again, he showed the impressive nature of the rampart. Um, and there's actually some early photographs of his work at Burghead. This is one of my favorites showing just the fragments of the wall face down in the lower part of the fo photograph. And hopefully you can just see in the background is his workmen, uh, the, the laborers who would have actually done all the hard work of excavation in that time period. Um, but also you can see the relatively um, poor standards uh, in terms of um, uh, excavation techniques um, in the 1890s. Uh, but Hugh Young did get some remarkable finds from Burghead, um, uh, some lots of animal remains, um, bone refuse, uh, and things like uh, ax heads and spear heads uh, from the excavations. Um, but it wasn't really until the 1960s that uh, the actual date of the fort was established. So in the 19th century, it was often thought to be a, a Viking fortress or a, or a Roman site, anything but Pictish, really. Uh, but Alan Small in the 1960s excavated on the Henlid and got some of the first radiocarbon dates showing that it was indeed of the Pictish uh, era, um, but not very accurate dates in that uh, context. So this is as a site survives today, less than half of it surviving. Um, and really, in our early work at the site, we had very low hopes of survival there. And all the, all the previous um, records suggested that the interior of the fort had largely been dug out and there was nothing surviving. But what we found in contrast was actually one of the best preserved picture sites there, are, there is, um, because actually all that kind of later landscaping, in some cases, actually preserved the floor layers, the quite delicate floor layers of buildings. And also Burkhead is essentially a big sand dune. So over the centuries, there's been lots of sand below events sealing um, some of the archaeology below those uh, horizons. Uh, so excavating in the gardens of the Coast Guard Station in the early years, 2015 to 19, we found floor layers of buildings. This is a 8th to 9th century uh, building here with the hearth here and all the black layers is actually destruction levels from the destruction of, of this building. Uh, and we got some really nice finds from the floor layers. This is two coins of, of King Alfred, the famous Anglo-Saxon king. Uh, but but the, the, the picks didn't use um, coins. So you can see these have actually been pierced for wearing. So the picks were literally wearing their wealth uh, around, around their necks. And then so less glamorous pieces. These are what we think might be bits of shield fittings or uh, furniture fittings and also bits of weaponry. This is a, a hilt of, of a sword, uh, again coming from the floor layer of that building. And also more mundane things like uh, leather working tools uh, here. 
And we sh basically, wherever we dug a trench in the burghead, we actually found buildings and, and structures and floor layers, including going underneath the modern buildings of burghead. Um, and then in 2018 and 19, we began to look at the ramparts themselves, digging up against the ramparts, uh, showing that so these are um, seem to be 7th, 8th century in date, so later than Rhiney in that kind of um, height of, of the Pictish kingdoms. And some really nice finds began to emerge, things like bramble-headed pins, little mace-headed pins um, from really good bone preservation on site. And then we also saw, like the antiquarians, the kind of remarkable wall of, of, of the fort, um, which in some cases still stands three, three and a half meters high. And you can actually see the burnt timber beams uh, horizontal beams and transverse beams going into the wall face. So one of the best preserved um, walls we have from this time period, uh, showing the construction methods of these timber-laced uh, ramparts. And then down the lower sit uh, citadel, lots of evidence for um, activity. Um, and our early dates suggested that this site was in use from the 6th century. So roughly when Wynie uh, and the lands landscape there seems to uh, show a, a big decline uh, through to the 10th century in the time period when the picks disappear as an identity. And we're actually just back from the field from Burkhead. Um, this was our first major excavations for uh, two years due to the uh, global pandemic. Uh, so it was actually quite exciting and uh, emotional to be back in the trenches. Uh, and this year we dug uh, trench up in the upper citadel and one down in the lower citadel, uh, as you can see here. And this is because we've just gotten a big grant from Historic Environment Scotland uh, for the citadel project, uh, basically because parts of the seaward defences are falling into the sea due to, due to uh, coastal erosion. Um, so over the next five years, we're going to excavate the, uh, a large area at the end of the headland and try and understand more about uh, the fort. And at the same time, do more, uh, or sorry, less invasive excavations down the lower citadel to compare the two elements of the fort. So in the upper citadel, we found more evidence for buildings shown in green here, sunken floor buildings, also metal working areas, um, and more nice finds coming out, more uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon coins, than in this case from Northumbria. This little one here is a coin of uh, Bishop Wigmund of York, for example, showing again the connections of these uh, late Pictish rulers. And then down in the lower citadel, uh, we found huge activity areas up against or towards uh, the uh, ramparts there, including evidence for, for buildings marked in orange here. Um, and again, really nice finds emerging um, to tell us a bit about the kind of lifestyles of the people living here. So beautiful bone pins, uh, bone combs of the type you see carved on Pictish stones. And we think, uh, yet to get this <clears throat> fully identified, but we think this might be a stylus from writing, you know, on wax tablets uh, and the like. So evidence for a literate culture here at Burghead. Uh, and this is a close up of one of these beautiful, delicate pins, probably hair pins. Uh, and also um, pictures of the remarkable bone preservation at Burghead. Uh, so things like cattle skulls, uh, red deer mandibles, horse mandibles. Um, bone preservation in Scotland tends to be pretty poor, so it's quite exciting for us to find this type of uh, evidence. So really, to kind of sum up what we've got at Burghead, well, we've got the largest enclosed site of this time period. Um, it clearly was a densely occupied site. So as I say, wherever we sink trenches, we are finding buildings. So this wasn't just a site that was retreated to at times of warfare. Um, it was clearly a major, major settlement. Um, and within that, uh, uh, the, the archeology span we're finding here, we're, we should be able to tell you a lot more about how such a major settlement and center was actually was uh, fed. Uh, so the bone preservation will allow us to look at things like the animal economy. Um, so mainly domesticate animals, but there are some evidence of, of hunting. Um, and we can see that cattle is incredibly important. Um, and that's really 
Uh, interesting because in contemporary Ireland, for example, where we have much better historical records, cattle is really the driver of early medieval economies. So something like 70, 80% of uh, the bone assemblages of some of these major Pictish sites are from, from cattle. Um, and we can also do some really interesting archaeological science on these uh, faunal remains. So we can do things like a, a strontium and oxygen, oxygen isotope analysis to look at the, the diet of, of the uh, domesticates and also look at uh, the catchment. Uh, and so far, it looks like uh, cows are actually coming from a larger uh, area than just from the local area. So it may well be that uh, cattle are actually being brought as tribute to this major um, elite centre and presumably royal centre in this time period. And also, um, we can see, as I say, that this was very much a Christian centre, uh, unlike perhaps Rhiney or Dunacair, uh, with all um, the Christian sculpture um, demonstrating um, the uh, wealth and power and the Christian nature of these late Pictish societies. And on the back of one of the cross lab uh, fragments in the National Museum, there's actually a carving of a, of a warrior. So you can see how secular and uh, religious power was intertwined uh, in this time period. And we also have some interesting objects from that uh, one in particular just came up recently, which is a carved stone head. And these tend to be um, thought to be pagan monuments, um, particularly Iron Age, but they do occur in later contexts as well. And these could well go with the bull carvings in terms of being part of an early, perhaps pagan uh, element to the site, maybe in the sixth century um, prior to the fort reaching its uh, height in the 7th, 8th and 9th centuries. Uh, and just finally, in terms of, of the dating of the site, what's really interesting is, is the end date of the site, which is in uh, the 10th century AD. And it's in the 10th century that really uh, the Pictish kingdoms come to an end. So there seems to be some sort of merging of the Picts and the Scots to create this kingdom of, of Alba in the 9th century and the beginning of the 10th century. Uh, and the most likely driver for that change is um, the beginnings of um, Norse settlement in the Northern Isles, which take over large parts of, of Northern Pickland and also parts of uh, Dalrida of the Scots in the West. And it's probably that Viking pressure uh, that leads to uh, the eventual merging of the Picts and Scots to, to fight this enemy, very much like the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms had to transform uh, in the face of Viking threat. So finally, I'll, I'll put out my hat. Um, if you want to support our project, we've got a Just Giving page. And I don't think I mentioned that we have a book out either, which is available in all great bookstores and online as well, 14.99, what a bargain. Anyway, thank you very much for listening um, and Happy to field questions. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Gordon, for a really interesting talk about a really rather mysterious uh, group of people. Um, what we generally do now is to have a short break of just uh, five minutes or so, during which time uh, people can type their questions uh, into the Q&A, not into the chat, please, but if you have questions for Gordon, please put them in the Q&A and uh, I will put them to him on your behalf. Um, so we'll just pause uh, for a little bit so that people get a chance to think of what questions they'd like to ask Gordon. Hi Gordon, can you, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you loud and clear. Uh, well, we've got quite a lot of questions. Uh, so I'll try to get through as many as possible. Yep. Um, one of the first questions that was asked was about whether or not the Picts built boats and might they have explored the coast very much and uh, perhaps gone to, for example, Orkney. Uh, do we know anything about that? Um, yes, they almost certainly had um, a fleet and had access to boats. Um, some of our earlier references, for example, talk about uh, Pictish kings from the mainland um, destroying the Orkneys. Uh, so clearly that must have been a, a, seaborn, a seaborn, um uh, raiding party. Uh, and that's a 7th century reference. 
And there's an 8th century reference to 150 Pictish ships being wrecked um, off the uh, coast of uh, Aberdeenshire. Um, and I think that's probably likely to be in a reading party as well, you know, 150 ships. And that's the reason it was recorded in the annals. It must have been such a major event at the time. Uh, in terms of the archaeology of, of Pictish boats, unfortunately, we don't have any any remains, but it seemed, you know, if we are going to find them, Burghead seems like a, a likely spot. So there's, you know, a wonderful sheltered harbour to the west of Burghead um, and also what was, used to be the sea lock at uh, Spiney would have given a sheltered anchorage. So it seems very likely that uh, Burghead was one of the kind of maritime uh, points or major uh, centres uh, of the pick, since maybe why it was such an important uh, centre, really. So yeah, lots of evidence, uh, well, not lots, but uh, glimpses of evidence for that. And certainly like, uh, like the Vikings or um, mm. uh, other societies, they were uh, raiding by, by sea. Okay, and while, while we're on the subject of sea, uh, there's also a question about whether they ate, is there any evidence that they ate marine fruit, fish or shellfish? Uh, yeah. Um, that's an interesting issue. Um, actually, after um, the Neolithic, the, you know, the first farmers, you know, 4000 uh, BC, there's actually relatively little evidence for the consumption of, of fish, certainly on a, as a major part of the diet, really until, until the Viking Age. Um, the Vikings seem to really uh, uh, create an upshot in, in the use of the marine um, economy and deep sea fishing and the like. Um, but it was probably a minor part of the diet, and certainly in the later phases of Burkhead, we were finding um, fish bone, cod, salmon, um, and also shellfish as well, which might either be consumed or being used for um, as bait for, for uh, fishing. So yes, uh, part of the diet, but probably a very minor part of the diet. And we can see that isotopically when we analyze skeletons of the picks, you can see that they must have consumed largely a terrestrial diet. Yeah, uh, doesn't that's surprising, is it not? It is surprising. Uh, yeah, it is surprising, but uh, that doesn't mean to say you know they're not eating fish, you know, a couple of times a week. But you know, it's not a major driver of the diet, and that's not uh, leaving a major signature on the bones uh, of 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 picks that we find in the ground. Um, there's, there's a number of questions about uh, the language. Do, do we have any idea what language they may have spoken? Yeah, we know it must have been a branch of uh, Britonic, uh, so place name evidence um, suggests that uh, it was a Britonic language, um, as do one or two uh, place names and um, historical records. Um, Beads, for example, talks about uh, there have been um, four languages in, in uh, um, Northern Britain at this time period, Anglo-Saxon, uh, Britonic, um, Gallic, and Pictish. So it, was, it seems like Pictish was um, distinct from Britonic, but uh, the, as I say, the place name evidence suggests it was related to Britonic, so perhaps it was a more localized dialect of Britonic. Um, and that's one of the reasons that uh, we, you know, maybe have relatively little records of, of the Picts is because Gaelic becomes the major language of uh, early Scotland, certainly by the 11th century through to the um, 13th century. Um, so, you know, Picts, uh, Pict, the Pictish language gets gets forgotten essentially and gets uh, erased. Um, right. If there were records written in Pictish, for example, they may well not have been kept. Mm. Um, and, and then there's some questions about Christianity um, yep. and how it took root among the Picts and uh, whether it might have come, for example, from Iona or by what route we think it, it took yeah. um, Probably different routes. There's probably some level of Christianity um, from uh, influences from Roman Britain um, and um, people living around about Hadrian's Wall. Um, there's inscribed stones from the, the uh, uh, 5th century, for example, down in southern Scotland that are, are Christian. But uh, there's no doubt that Iona and um, uh, Irish missionaries were, were important. Um, and the traditional narrative is that uh, Columba um, converts the, the northern Picts and 
Ninian converts the 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 southern picts, um, and certainly Gildas talks about some of the picts as being apostates, so implying that they uh, were had been, or at least some of them had been Christian at, at one time. Um, and there was certainly some conversion in the sixth century in uh, northern areas, and certainly by the seventh century, um, our sources have no indication that the Picts were were pagan or any way different in terms of religion. So, and certainly the archaeology would would back that up in terms of, you know, early churches and early carved stone monuments are likely to be seventh eighth centuries. So, certainly by that time period, by the time of Burghead at its height. Uh, these were fully Christian uh, kingdoms. There's also a question about uh, the symbols on the stones um, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> that there's been a previous suggestion that, that they might have been kinship, but uh, were they also sort of totem poles? And, and has yeah. that idea received any crit real critical appraisal or is it just speculation oh yeah you can imagine you know that's been one of the fascinations of the picks uh, since the 19th century is you know uh, how do we crack the code how do we understand this uh, symbol system and to be honest you know we probably won't ever unless we find some sort of a rosetta stone that allows us to uh, uh, decipher um i think the most likely interpretation is that they are an, a naming tradition so as, as I showed in some of the early slides, you can see some of the later stones that show individuals and they're marked by paired symbols. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not like um, hieroglyphs where you, you get lots and lots of these uh, symbols. They tend to be you know, pairs or at the most four symbols. So the messages must have been very short. So again, it seems most likely that names or mm -hmm. some sort of identity marker is, 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 is most likely. Um, in terms of their context, we can now show that they, 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 they're actually found in a variety of different contexts. They, so um, some of the early scholarships suggest that they were, um, you know, marking burials. And in some cases, they do seem to mark burials, but they're also clearly found at settlement sites like the Rhiney standing at the entranceway to the uh, complex at Dunacare. Looks like they were built into the rampart. Um, and Burghead as well, they look like they were at the entranceway to the, to the fort where the bulls were anyway. Um, so they're found in a variety of different contexts, which again, if it was a naming tradition, makes sense. You know, you might have a name of someone uh, uh, who's buried at a monument and name perhaps of a ruler at a settlement. So, um, so multi-purpose, and uh, that's our best guess at the moment. Right. Uh, there's also a question about whether there's any genetic evidence of the pics that we can see or trace in uh modern celtic people or whatever yeah. you know and the idea of red hair and freckles and so on <laughs> being pictish is that yeah is that again <laughs> pure conjecture or is it a genetic signature of pics um well yes it is conjecture um uh you'll you'll read lots about this and you know there's various um uh organizations will uh you know take your money to do modern DNA tests and say you're, you know, 10% Pictish, but it's all based on modern DNA patterns. Um, so until we get more ancient DNA, it's all nonsense really. And it's just, you know, wild, not necessarily wild speculation, but speculation for sure. Um, problem is we don't have a huge number of Pictish cemeteries um, and there's only been some very pr preliminary uh, studies of that, including we're involved in a few um, DNA studies. So, I think watch this space, but uh, you know whether we can, you know, relate that to modern genetics. Well, we can obviously, but uh, yeah, it's uh, time will tell, basically. Okay, so there are uh, human remains from the cemeteries, but not from the the citadel type sites. Uh, um, as a general rule, yes, but actually, uh, it's not something I mentioned tonight. But we actually have. Um, a skull and a long bone from Burghead that's in the mm -hmm. National Museum. And we just recently dated that. We think that they're, they're from James McDonald's excavations um, in the 1860s. And he talks about a cemetery just outside the fort on, on, the, other, on the Seaward side. Uh, and we dated those to the 7th, 8th century. So they're from the height of the, the fort. So a cemetery just outside the fort there. So, um, you know, we may well find other 
you know, cemeteries within the fort or near the near the chapel site within the fort. So, yeah, it'd be great to find more remains of actual pigs you can see mm -hmm. lived, lived at these sites. Um, we do have one burial from Rhiney as well, where we um, got a date from the human remains and might be able to DNA sample. But other than that, there's a few cemeteries that maybe have you know a dozen, a couple of dozen burials at most. Um, as I say. Soil in, in Scotland is generally pre pretty acidic, so not good for bone survival. Mm. Um, can can the public visit uh, the site, at, for example, the site at Workhead? Is it open in any way to the public? Or? Yes, yeah. So you can wander around. It's you know it's the modern town today, um, but during the uh, warmer months, um, there is a little centre at the. Uh, you maybe noticed the little uh, white tower at the end of the promontory. Mm. Uh, is the old Coast Guard station, and there's a little museum in there that has um, a couple of the Burkhead bulls, fragments of the Christian sculpture, and a great model of what the fort looked like. So it's well worth a visit. Um, Rhiney, it's you know you can see some of the stones, uh, the old church there, um, and uh, Dunnacare, not a huge amount to see other than the snack uh, today. Um, but there's great museums like El Elgin Museum, um, Tarbert Discovery Centre. Um, so, yeah, get yourselves there and support those places, please. And there's a question, intriguing question about <laughs> slavery. Um, uh, I mean, I know there, there, there are some early drawings of what appear to be slaves. Is there any evidence of slavery being part of that kind of culture? Very yes. topical question. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And it's one we tend to shy away from a little bit, but there's no doubt the Picts had slaves. Um, Gildas in the fifth century uh, rails against the Picts as, uh, uh, for slave trading and for taking into captivity uh, some Christian um, uh, uh, communities and, and people from uh, further south. Um, and uh, there's also references in the life of Columba to slaves within the Pictish court of King Berthay uh, and contemporary Ireland, uh, where we have a really rich historical record, you know, there's whole different categories of, of slaves. So, but yeah, unfortunately, this is an you know, incredibly hierarchical society and we shouldn't romanticise mm -hmm. uh, society in this time period as much as... Uh, we do really. It's fascinating and it's really interesting to find out about uh, these societies and, and communities, but we cer certainly shouldn't uh, um, romanticize them. Mm. Um, there's a question about textiles. Is there any sign of textiles or what? Yeah. You, you mentioned that you mentioned weaving at, at one point, but uh, no textiles. No, nothing surviving. Uh, we no, tell a lie. No, there is one. There's a, the Orkney Hood, which is a woolen uh, shawl, which is in the National Museum. A fantastic uh, item that was found in a peat bog up in the Orkney Isles, which dates from uh, the Pictish period. Um, there's a couple of leather shoes from a site at Dundurn, which have got beautiful punch decoration. Um, and then obviously we've got all the brooches and things surviving that, that survive better. So these you know, people would have been you know, incredibly well dressed at, at certainly at these elite centres, um, and you know there must have been quite sights to see, I would imagine. And also, you know, the, the name Picts implies that they were painted, they were tattooed, certainly in the earlier earlier periods. So, um, yeah, they would have probably been very striking individuals, I would think. Hmm. Uh, there are questions connected with, you know, what happened to them. Uh, <laughs> What brought it all to an end? Was it Norse invaders? Uh, what was it? Uh, yeah. Or was it from other cultures in Scotland? I mean, you mentioned that they joined in order to fend off the Vikings, but might did they did they lose? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, that's one of the big questions about uh, the Picts in the bit uh, of early medieval Scotland is what happens to the Picts because that identity just seems to. Uh, suddenly really um, just disappear from the records in the late 9th century, early 10th century, I think is the last reference. Um, I think there's a whole manner of different things going on. There's um, definitely um, a language shift. So Gaelic becomes the major language. 
Um, so, and that's probably partly to do with the influence of the church and Irish missionaries, um, but also probably due to Viking pressure in the West and the North, probably leading to more Gaelic set settlers coming into the East. Um, and so, you know, Pictish clearly goes out of use um, and is maybe you're already going out of use, you know, for example, things like the symbols, you, you actually don't really see much of those at some of these later uh, royal centers the, of the ninth century. Um, so it's probably, you know, partly losing territory to the, to the Norse um, language shift and probably the need to unite against, you know, new enemies, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And really it's, um, you know, the, the, also losing that kind of ethnic dimension to the name as well in terms of Alba is just a name for Britain. So it's, you know, it's, it's more of a territorial name rather than ethnic name. So, you know, by the time, you know, 9th, 10th century, if you've got Gaelic speakers, you've got um, Pictish speakers, you've got Norse speakers in living in areas of, of Pickland, maybe even Anglo-Saxon speakers as well, um, then, you know, you, you can imagine that these territorial names based on ethnicities are gonna, gonna go. So, you know, the later historiography is, is full of, um, you know, Game of Thrones style massacres of the Gales killing all the Picts, but there's nothing in the contemporary sources that suggests anything quite as dramatic as that. I think, you know, there does seem to be a shift towards Gaelic speaking kings and, and uh, uh, language, um, but doesn't that doesn't mean that that's, you know, a dramatic, you know, knife in the back and all the Picts get massacred type event. And other questions about their interaction uh, with the Romans. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, the, the different sort of tribes in Scotland might have united to fend off the new enemy coming from the north. But what about the old enemy, the Romans, and the moving down on the Antonine Wall? Or did they raid down there? Or did they go as far as yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Adrian's Wall? You know, what, why, and why did they? Scotland not unite more against the Romans? Well, I think that's an earlier example of, of uniting against a, against a common enemy. So, uh, so as I say, the Picts does seem to be a, an amalgamation of lots of different tribal identities you get, uh, get referred to in the first and second centuries AD. By the time you get to the third and certainly the fourth century, they really only talk about the Picts, you know, the, the painted people. Um, and that could just be a nickname, you know, they don't know much about what's going on north, but, uh, you know, as you find in other areas of uh, frontier situations, you do tend to, certainly in that late Roman period, get people and groups merging together to try and uh, take on the empire and uh, resist the empire. Um, so I think really it's the, the Romans that lead, you know, create the picks, you know, create their own enemy and they create, they create a source of uh, power that actually, you know, helps lead to the demise of um, occupation of, of Roman Britain and the eventual withdrawal of the, of the Roman uh, troops. Uh, mm. So the Picts are a major part of that big event in AD 367, the Barbarian Conspiracy, which, you know, really um, took Roman Britain to its knees, really. Um, so, yeah, creating their own eventual downfall, really. Mm. Uh you showed a couple of coins in your talk with holes drilled, holes drilled on, in them. Uh, yeah. But and you also said that Picts didn't use coins. These are coins from elsewhere. So what what did they use? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was only certain areas of Anglo-Saxon England and certain time periods that used, used coins. You know, the Irish, the Britonic areas were also non-coin using. Um, and it's, essentially it was a barter system and, and uh, you know, a um, subsistence system. So they would have been using things like uh, raw materials, um, cut up bits of silver. Uh, you see, you see um, things like Roman vessels being cut up and circulated to, to native groups, but also circulating within um, native society itself in that late Roman period. Uh, and things like brooches, we know that kings are giving out brooches and handpins uh, to their followers uh, to create that um, networks of, of allegiance. Um, and things like uh, in early medieval Ireland, you know, you, you, again, where you have things like law tracks uh, preserved, you know, you have to give your king 
uh, every year are certain amounts of tribute and that's both in mm -hmm. terms of food things like you know honey um, cattle um, but also service so you have to give certain amounts of labor and people and weeks per year to build the king's ramparts for example um, or to uh, go to war with the king or to um, uh, man um, vessels at sea so yeah that's the kind of thing that are driving the economy. There's also uh, a question about the hill fort at Benaki. Was uh, is that also a Pictish site? Or... <laughs> yeah, I didn't really talk about that site tonight. There's lots of sites I could have mentioned. Uh, <laughs> we've been working at Benahi as well uh, in Aberdeenshire, which uh, um, uh, is this really impressive citadel uh, fort um, with a really impressive wall as well and we've we've excavated there recently and showed that was occupied in this time period as well seventh eighth ninth centuries ad uh, and um there are a couple of lost gallic sagas that seem to refer to benahi as being a major political center so again it looks like uh, another one of these centers was one of these fortified hilltop settlements in that case um mm. Um, actually much smaller than Tappan North, but uh, may well have had settlements and buildings out with the fort as well. Uh, there's also a question that you, you showed a slide of the, the dice tower, the little on, you know, game. Uh, and uh, the questioner says it remind the shape of it reminded her of Dunfermline Abbey Tower. Uh, is that just coincidence, or I don't know. I, I don't know anything about. It. Neither did she about when the tower at Dunfermline Abbey was built. Yeah, it's just just coincidence. It's, it's um, coincidence. you know the you know it's uh, they're just a, they're um, essentially they're a form of of uh, gaming. Um, you know, like my son plays gaming. All they you, you you drop the dice down and they fall down steps. So they're mm -hmm. just a kind of a table piece as part, part of a game. So I don't think they're really meant to represent any particular building or building form per se. Um, and certainly nothing like that was, you know, um, constructed in, in Scotland other than perhaps towers of Roman forts, maybe. Yeah. There's also a question, about, a, a broader question about how you uh, identify sites that are worth excavating. Uh, how do you decide where to go is it based on where previous excavations have been or do you cruise about the country looking for say lightly sites uh, and are, are there many more to be discovered do you think um yes definitely lots more to discover but the one of the traditional problems of pictish archaeology is really finding the sites um so as well as a, um, a lack of historical records, there's actually very few uh, archaeological sites. Um, so unlike the Iron Age, you know, for example, where you got thousands of, of hill forts of that time period, you got thousands of roundhouses that are found um, through excavation, through development-led excavation, for example. Um, you know, the number of picture settlements in eastern Scotland, for example, on the mainland, is, you know, you could count mm -hmm. on one, one or two hands, really. And it seems to be because they're going to um, build structures in different ways, you know, using things like turf walls and crux frames, which archaeologically don't survive very well, unless you've got a, you know, unique situation like Borg Head, where, you know, sand below and later development kind of seals those um, down below. Um, so, yeah, it's been a real challenge to find sites. So we've been casting our net wide. We've been excavating lots of forts only some of which turn out to be of, of this date. Uh, and we also target sites that have been excavated. For example, it, um, Burghead was excavated in the 19th century, Dunacare, they had the fine spots of the stones in the 19th century. So it's that kind of clues that help. Um, but there's no doubting that it is quite difficult to find sites like this. Um, but it shows you that, you know, little bits of work like Tappan North, you know, where we've Currently, you know, suddenly went from, you know, a handful of of potential Pictish buildings in uh, eastern Scotland to, you know, perhaps as many as eight hundred uh, 
houses on the on this hill you know you, it just shows you how quickly and dramatically you can change our understanding in the archaeological record overnight just by just by looking essentially yes. um there was a question asking uh, for you to post the crowdfunding link again and i, I see you've done that yeah uh, so Gordon's given that that. <laughs> <laughs> again uh uh post it in the chat if you if you wish to take part in the crowdfunding um uh, there's a question about the paint, you know, the idea that pigs were painted people. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any anything from Pictish stones or, or the way in which people are depicted that would suggest that that was true? Uh, it just occurred to me the word depicted is. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it probably means that. Yeah, it literally means painted. So yeah, I think it almost certainly means they are certainly in the Roman Iron Age they are they are tattooed. Or they're decorated in, in some way, you know, perhaps with, you know, things like ochre and wood and all this kind of classic images you see. Of <laughs> I, I don't think we can doubt, you know, certain people probably were, um, you know, uh, had, you know, decorated themselves in that way. Um, but there are, there is, I forget who it is, but there is a later um, antique um, author who refers to the pics as being tattooed as well. I think that's sixth century. Um, so yeah, I'm sure they were. It probably became fr increasingly frowned upon in 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 the, in the Christian context, I would think. But um, you know, who knows really? And one of the ideas about the symbols and their origin is that they may well have started as a, a tattooing system. You know, um, painting or um, actually tattooing your 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 name or your clan or your identity on your, mm -hmm. on your body, and that seems you know plausible. Um, and that system gets transferred to presumably wooden monuments and, and as well as stone monuments. You know, it's just again, it's a matter of survival. All we have is is the stone monuments, but you know, there would have been a world of wood and leather and um, other uh, organic material that you know, unfortunately, with you know, we very rarely get preserved. Mm. Um. We're going to run out of time soon. We've been putting a lot of questions to you. Um, I'll just ask you if it's okay, a couple more. Um, yeah. uh, there's quite a bit of interest in uh, the the animals uh, that are either, you know, uncovered in the excavations from their remains or uh, on the, the stones. Um, and, and, and you showed these bull ones and so on and other ones that look like they might be wolves or something like that do do we know anything about their relationship with not just the animals they ate but uh with animals that they may you know have had as, as symbols or companions or anything like that yeah yeah um again without any historical records it's you know it's difficult to say say for sure but uh Certainly, we know in, in you know, um, contemporary cultures in, in the Roman Iron Age, you know, animals, certain animals certainly were, were, were sacred and part of the pagan religion. Bulls, I think, you know, are an obvious element of, of uh, a religious belief in terms of their, their strength and their fertility. Um, and we can see, you know, in, in earlier Iron Age culture, you get uh, deposits of, of cattle, skulls, um, in, in particular locations, uh, animal bones found within burials um, and as foundation deposits for, for buildings. So uh, I have no doubt that it was part of the, you know, the spiritual and religious culture of both the pagans uh, um, and the Christian pigs. Um, obviously, you know, animals have lots of uh, spiritual dimensions within the Christian culture as well. Um, and you know it's no coincidence that you know, a number of the Pictish symbols are are animals, and they they're not they're not your everyday. Cattle, pig, and sheep. Um, you never get sheep depicted. Uh, pigs um, really only as well boar, um, and you get the the fearsome bulls as well. So. You know, they're they're choosing particular animals that may well have had more meaning and significance mm -hmm. um, rather than the kind of everyday animals 
So yeah, it's really fascinating to to think about that. I think yes, perhaps more aggressive animals. Uh, mm. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things you see on the later Christian stones um, depicted are fantastic hunt scenes. So people um, on horseback um, chasing stags and, and deer. Um, and there's no doubt that that would have been part of elite culture as well. You know, we do find one or two um, you know, examples of wild resources at places like Burghead. So it's, you know, like, it's not an everyday part of the economy, but it's something that they really emphasize on the picture stones as, again, a, I think a marker of elite culture and dominance over, over nature, I guess, and uh, hunting grounds and territory, yeah. And, and just final question then, when you mentioned dominance over nature, uh, mm -hmm. you made frequent reference to these massive wooden palisades that they constructed. And, and I know you've had an interest in the history of forests in Scotland and, I guess even by the time we're speaking about, a lot of the woodland had been lost from Scotland, perhaps. Do we know much about how forested the landscape they lived in was? Yeah, it would certainly be more forested than today, but, um, you know, the winter had the, the wild woods of, of the Mesolithic or even the early Neolithic. Um, but certainly they were able to get a hold of some very sizable, you know, oak timbers. Uh, for building their ramparts so you know they're able to access you know hundreds if not thousands of of oak trees um, to build places like Burghead um, but such as the power of, of those rulers they may well have been you know floating those timbers in from other mm -hmm. parts um, of Scotland or moving them across the land um, but uh, yeah certainly it would have been a significant uh, forest cover in terms of you know you would need that for things like hunting um but yeah an ever decreasing forest cover so for example in the northern isles and caithness and pictish sites there you can see that by the kind of later pictish phase they're tending to use things like uh peat or animal dung for fuel clearly because there was less and less timber um going around mm. Well, it's almost uh, nine o'clock, uh, Gordon, and so I think we uh, we should draw this to a close. Um, uh, there, there are some more questions. I'm, I'm sorry for the questions uh, that we didn't manage to ask, uh, but for the questioners whose questions we didn't manage to ask. But uh, uh, that was really a, a fascinating talk, Gordon, about uh, you know, as you said, mysterious people really uh, and Gordon's just put a, a link on to a Facebook site and, and as he mentioned uh, he's got a book out on these uh, northern pics and also a previous book on forestry so uh, on the, well, the deforestation perhaps uh, so uh, the history of, the, of forestry so thank you very much on behalf of the whole society and we can just end it there. I'll just remind people that the next talk is on the 20th of October and it's been given by uh, Stephen Reichert from the University of uh, St Andrews on what the pandemic has taught us about human nature, uh, which will undoubtedly be interesting. Uh, so uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, so Good night, everybody, and see you.
on the 20th of October.